In the last book of the Bible, the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, we read these beautiful words. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his temple. And God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Now what makes these words so beautiful is the fact that death, tears, grief, and pain have been the experience of mankind since the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. It is there in the book of Genesis that we see that suffering is the, well, the direct result of the sin and rebellion that was let loose on earth back in the garden. From the time of the fall, when sin and death entered the world, until the coming of Jesus, sin and death reigned. From Genesis to the Gospels, we see Jesus promised and the world prepared for his entry into it. And then we see Jesus coming, living, teaching, healing, being persecuted, suffering, dying, and rising from the dead to purchase our deliverance from sin and death and the suffering that is their companion. And Paul makes it clear in this passage that we read this morning in Philippians, the third chapter, that we are living in the time when the world waits for the consummation of Jesus' glorious kingdom when sin and death and pain and grief and all their repercussions will be totally obliterated. In this time, though, Paul makes it clear that we are called to join with Jesus by entering into his kingdom and participating in the reclaiming of the world by believing in him and then taking up our crosses and following him. And it's all in this context that Paul says that he rejoices and he longs for being involved in the fellowship of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Those words, the fellowship of his sufferings, that's what I really want to concentrate on this morning, because there are a lot of people that seem to think that when you become a Christian, from that point on, God's supposed to just pave the way before you, that you just sprinkle rose petals along the way, and everything's supposed to be easy. And you know, that's not exactly right. Blessings are promised to God's people. Blessings, prosperity, lots of good things are promised to God's people. No doubt about it. And if we're living the life that God wants us to live, it's going to be a lot better life than if we tried to be at enmity with our Creator. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to face problems, that we're not going to face suffering. In fact, it's made very clear throughout the Bible that because of the enmity of the world against God and against Christ Jesus, his people are going to wind up facing persecution and tribulations and suffering 
just for being his. And I, uh, I, this morning, I just thought, well, I wonder how often that's really mentioned. And I was thinking maybe 20 times, you know, so I got up to a hundred. I've got 10 pages from the Old Testament to the New Testament talking about persecution and the trials that come from persecution. I'm just going to read a few of them. I'm not going to go through 10 pages of this stuff. It'd be so heavy. By the time we walked out of here, we'd be dying. You know, we'd be suffering from all this reading. So I don't want to inflict more pain on you. Uh, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And then Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then Paul says in 2 Corinthians, For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Just one more from Jesus. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. The fellowship of his suffering. If we have taken up our cross and followed him, and his spirit has indwelt us, and we are his, and he is our Lord, he is going to be with us, And we are going to be on a great adventure for God, just like the Blues Brothers. You remember how they set out on that adventure for God? Well, that's every Christian. We're on a mission for God. And as we continue on that mission, we're going to see miracles. We're going to see blessings. We're going to see the power of God at work in our lives. And we're going to face a lot of hassles and a lot of troubles and a lot of persecution. It's all a part of the passel, of the package. But the thing is, as we are doing this, we are doing it with him. He is with us. And there's a fellowship in his uh, suffering, you see, that we can have in no other way. It's that's whenever you're close to him. And so this is what I'm trying to cover with you this morning. As we live lives dedicated to him and witness for him, we're going to face persecution. We're going to face resistance, just like Jesus did. We may very well find ourselves suffering for our faith. And that's what Paul's talking about when he speaks of the fellowship of his suffering. He's not talking about just bearing up under some inconvenience in life. A lot of people, they think that anything bad going on in their life is a cross. Like some people, they, they're put out with their husbands or their wives. And they'll say, well, that's just my cross to bear. That's not what is being talked about here. Or they get a cold and say, I'm just suffering for Jesus. No, that's not what it's talking about. And then you'll see... Some people will hurt themselves. You you see them whipping themselves and they're trying to suffer for Christ. You don't have to gin up suffering. 
It's going to come, okay? You don't have to punish yourself. The world's going to be trying to do that for you. And so you don't worry about that. You just worry about being the best you that you can be for Jesus. And let him be right there with you. And you're going to go through some stuff together. And his fellowship will be there with you. When you come to know him, and walk with him and are living a life that is a mission for him, you're going to be attacked by the enemy, Satan, and the world, and you're going to be misled, uh, or you're going to be also attacked by worldly people and misled people. Some people are going to be thinking they're going to do God a favor by coming after you. As you experience those things and stay steadfast in your faith, you will know him and his presence in ways that you never could otherwise. Have you ever known someone who truly put their life on the line in order to serve the Lord? Someone who's really, and you can tell genuinely, they've given it all up for the Lord. They're different, aren't they? They're stronger, they're deeper, They know Jesus Christ better. When you give up pleasures, protections, privileges for the sake of serving the Lord Jesus, you can't help but be closer to him because he's going to draw close to you. Usually it involves suffering. You move into a whole new level of fellowship with Christ. You share in the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to read, or not read, I just want to let you know about three benefits of the fellowship of his sufferings. First, when you suffer for the Lord's sake, you are drawn closer to him. We've been talking about that already. It is in those times that you'll feel closer to him than at any other. I guess the most pronounced example I can remember of that is when I heard Uh, the account of a priest, Catholic priest in Vietnam who had befriended a uh, U.S. soldier. And uh, this U.S. soldier and this this priest really grew close. And one morning, the priest invited invited him to go with him to a village in Vietnam. He said he was having to go really early because the Viet Cong were patrolling the area. But if they left early enough, they should miss them. Well, it turns out they got caught. And the Viet Cong took them both. And seeing that he was a priest and knowing they were heading to a village to do religious services, they took plywood and they basically crucified both of them on sheets of plywood and hung those sheets of plywood up from a tree with these two men hanging there. Now the priest, they took special delight in torturing and mutilating him. And as they were hanging there with the soldiers down below the Viet Cong, deriding them and reviling them just like the crowds did Jesus. The priest turned to the U.S. soldier and he said, Ross, isn't it wonderful? And he said, isn't what wonderful? To be able to just share a little bit in the sufferings of our Lord. And then at the top of his lungs, he sang, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And he died. The uh, U.S. soldier made it through that ordeal. The uh, U.S. troops caught up with him before he died. And he was able to share that account. It's another, but you see, that priest was on a mission for God. 
And because of that, even in the midst of his pain, he knew God's presence in ways that we can know in no other. Another important benefit that comes from suffering for Christ is you become a better witness for him. Just imagine how that affected those Viet Cong soldiers as they saw that. Ask people about what influenced them when they became Christians. Very often you'll hear something like this. Well, here's how it happened. Someone in my department at work became a Christian and I was suspicious because I knew him. But I watched him first for a month, then for six months, and then for a year, and then for two years. And you know, every time something bad happened to him, he took it in stride. Over time, I saw in his life what I needed in my life, an inner strength, a ballast, a purpose. You see, when someone knows Jesus and they suffer with dignity, it demonstrates that quiet confidence that Christ and the Holy Spirit whisper to those who watch. And what it whispers to those who watch is, this is a miracle. This is what I'm all about. This is my power perfected in weakness. This is my grace sufficient for you. Let me tell you, you can go over the four spiritual laws and you can rehearse the gospel with someone for years and seemingly get nowhere but when they see your faith at work, when the chips are down, they know you found something deep in Christ. The fact is that growing deeper in your faith through the trials and difficulties, uh, the, uh, it, well, it, uh, the Lord allows in those times, uh, when he allows those things to come in your life, it's really the fast track to Christ likeness. Suffering does certain things in us that really could never happen in any other way. Suffering prepares us for greater service for Christ because it toughens our faith and it builds strength in us. Last one. One of the reasons suffering makes us better servants is we learn by experience that God isn't going to leave you when things get tough. We learn that he is faithful to help us in times of trouble, not to keep us from them, but to help us in them. We actually learn to overcome fear and trust in God's sufficiency for us. Sadly, many never learn to trust his power to deliver and help them because they always run from situations that threaten them, even though they may know that the Lord is leading them. And so they sadly never experience what the Lord can do for them. When we undergo trials and suffering enabled by his grace, we learn to trust him and to rely on his power to not only keep us from anything outside his perfect will for us, but also to make every situation work out for the good of the kingdom and for you. Jesus' greatest moments were not when people ooed and awed and thanked him after he worked miracles nor was it in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem because the very ones who praised him called for his blood two days later. The crowning moment of the greatest life in human history was when he suffered infinitely more than we can imagine and died rejected and alone on a cross. This is the fellowship Paul said the Christian is called into the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so the question this morning is, do you really want to live for Jesus 
Are you willing to get elbow deep in this ministry of life that he has for you to be involved in? Are you willing to take risks for him? Are you willing to break out of your comfort zone, which too often is a euphemism for a disobedience zone? Here's what Paul's saying. There is something to fear that is worse than suffering or death, and that is a wasted life, a life that could have been a life in Christ with its gifts and its opportunities, but wasn't. That's a sad life. Here's the point at which the follower of Christ is perfected and moves into the image of Christ when he says, Jesus is Lord. And whatever sufferings I must endure in order to enter his fellowship and his sufferings, I welcome them. I welcome them. Knowing Christ through the fellowship of his suffering is tied to the hope of the resurrection. As he closes verse 11, Paul ties the goal of knowing Christ through the fellowship of his suffering to the hope of the resurrection. One chapter ago, Paul had already mentioned that it was because of Christ's obedience to the point of death on the cross that God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the highest name and eternal glory as Lord. And so it is in the same way for us who follow Christ, for we who have taken up our crosses, we know that by the promise of our faithful God, it is going to be worth it all. At a moment in time, it may not seem like it, but by faith we know that it is. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, the fourth verse, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. See, he didn't say, I just coasted to the finish line. That's not what he said, is it? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. It's going to be worth it all on that day, folks. But we need to understand that for Paul, the full meaning of the resurrection is not just in the glory that is coming. It's also in the resurrection power that is now available through Christ Jesus day by day. In Ephesians, the first chapter, he prayed that the eyes of the believers' hearts would be enlightened in order that they might know the hope which he has called them to the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. So that power is not just for the resurrection. It's for your daily living. That power is uh, like that which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now I'll close with this. In November 1964, anarchy broke out in the Belgian Congo. And Assemblies of God missionary J.W. Tucker knew that he was at risk, but he stayed where God had placed him. And one day, a mob attacked and killed him with sticks, clubs, fists, and broken bottles. Then they took his body, body and they threw it in the back of a truck and drove to the Bomakande River in what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And then they tossed his body to the reptile, to the, to the crocodiles. J.W. Tucker had risked everything and yet seemingly 
He had nothing to show for it. But 30 years later, 30 years after his death, the truth of how God used that missionary's sacrifice surfaced. The Bumakande River flows through the middle of the Mangbetu tribe, a people virtually without the gospel. During the time of civil war, the Mangbetu king became very concerned with the violence and he appealed to the central government in Kinshasa for help. The central government responded by sending a man called the Brigadier, a well-known policeman of strong stature and reputation who came from the region of Isiro. J.W. Tucker had won the Brigadier to the Lord just two months before he was killed. The Brigadier knew that the only real way to peace was through the gospel. And so he prayed that he might present it well. He heard of a Mangbetu tradition that said, if the blood of any man flows in the Bomakande River, you must listen to his message. This saying had been with the Mangbetus for generations. The brigadier called for the king and all the village elders and he told them, some time ago, a man was killed. His body was thrown into the Bomaconde River. The crocodiles ate him up. His blood flowed in your river. But before he died, he left me a message. This message concerns God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ who came to this world to save people who were sinners. He died for the sins of the world. He died for my sins. I received this message and it changed my life. As the big brigadier preached, the spirit of God descended and people began to fall on their knees and to cry out to the Lord. And many were converted. Since that day, thousands of Magbetus have committed their life to Christ and dozens of churches have opened as a result of the message from the man whose blood flowed in the Bumakande River. For those who want to know Christ, to experience him fully, for those who are willing to follow him in obedience, no matter what level of suffering may be involved. For those who want to enjoy the power of his resurrection in the here and now. For those who want to experience the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. For those they will receive, as Peter put it, a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.